So, welcome everyone. Um, so for the next 60 minutes we're going to talk about a topic that's probably new to almost all of you. It's called residuality theory. It's a new way of thinking about the systems that we work with as engineers, as architects. So, if you haven't met me before, I run a, a company called Black Tulip Technology, which is actually based in, in Sweden. Um, I'm currently a PhD candidate in complexity science and software engineering. In a previous life, uh, I've been a, a chief architect at Microsoft and responsible for the solutions architecture community at Microsoft. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about today came out of trying to solve a very particular problem there, which was we need more architects. How do we teach architects? How do we train architects? What do we, what do we teach them? What do they need to know? Which led to me asking the question, what is architecture? What is it that we actually do? And after several years of not getting any concrete answers to those questions, I decided to start a research project and do something about it. So the problem that we're trying to solve is this. Why is software architecture so difficult? Why is it so difficult that we don't know how to train software architects? The way that we train software architects is that we take a senior developer or someone who seems like they know what they're doing, we walk them over to the edge of the cliff and we push them into the water. <laughs> and then we go away. And we come back two years later and we look down and if there's someone swimming down there, we have an architect. <laughs> if they've drowned, we take the next developer who seems to know what they're doing and bring them over to the cliff edge and say, look at this. That's how we do it. We don't actually know. And even when we have senior experienced architects and we say to them, how did you make these decisions? Where did these decisions come from? What are they based on? They don't know. They can't answer the question. And that's something that's been shown in, in scientific research. <coughs> when you ask a bunch of architects anonymously, how did you arrive at this set of design decisions? They say, nah, we're not really sure. It's, it becomes gut feeling that we build up over a career. And that's a very difficult thing to teach to a junior architect. How do you teach? Nah. It's difficult. <laughs> so I started digging around this question, talking to senior architects, thinking about my own practice. It comes down to a number of things that, that make the difference. And the first thing we have to understand is the difference between order and disorder. So in the world, some systems, I have to stay here? Okay, I think they're scared of me falling. Um, <laughs> so some systems are ordered. What does that mean? A system that is ordered is highly constrained. That means that it's made up of a bunch of components and those components can't really do anything that they're not allowed to do. They're constrained by the other components, by the design of the system, by the structure of the system. And you can predict the future states of an ordered system. You can say what's going to happen in the future. And you can test the system. You can say, if I do A, then I'm going to get B. And I'm going to repeatedly get B over a period of time. And so software, by that definition, is an ordered system. Your car is an ordered system. On the other hand, we have something called disordered systems. And those systems are loosely constrained. The elements of those systems can do whatever they want, when they want, and they're not predictable, and they're not controllable. And if you do A, you might get B, and you might get something different. So it, instead of software, think of a bunch of teenagers. as a disordered system. You try to do something, it doesn't work. They surprise you all the time. And the difference between these two kinds of systems it really helps us to understand the problem that we have that we're trying to solve as architects. So human systems, business systems, markets, economies, these are disordered systems. And one of the problems we've had classically in enterprise architecture is that we treat disordered systems like ordered systems. And we say, no, we just draw a bunch of lines and boxes and it will work. And that hasn't been historically very successful. And so, as I started to dig into this question, I found that a lot of the answers, a lot of the discussions, a lot of the things that I thought were interesting existed within the complexity sciences, which is a, a discipline in itself. Um, 
And complexity science is fascinating if you're, if you're a nerd and you're into that kind of thing. But it's also terribly pointless if you're a software engineer, because you can read book after book after book about chaos theory, about complexity, about social complexity, but none of it will ever tell you what to do in a software system. So it's a, it's a, it's a bunch of stories that help us to feel good, but it doesn't help us to do our jobs in any way differently. So we need to change how we, how we do that. We need to make comple these com lessons from complexity science relevant to software engineering. And so one of the first things we do is we define a new concept, and that concept is a hyperliminal system. A hyperliminal system is just an ordered, structured piece of software which we place inside a disordered, pulsating ball of madness, which we call a business or an enterprise. And this, these two systems are very closely related to each other. The structure of the software system will be crushed and pushed around and bullied by the external system. And we're constantly, as architects, we have to be in here and we have to do the logical thing and the mathematics and we have to, to do the ordered testing and all the engineering around this system. And then we've got to jump out of that into the disordered system and say, is this the right system that I'm building for this particular pulsating ball of madness? And what is that? And then we've got to jump back in and we've got to jump back out and back in and back in and out. And that's what makes architecture difficult because we've got to constantly work between these two worlds. And if you go into this disordered world and try to use ordered tools, the world will come crashing down around you because those ordered tools won't work. There is no structure here. You can't treat people the same way we, cheap, we treat chips on a board. They don't like it. And you can't treat software the same way we treat teenagers, even though some people like to do that and call it agile. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> with, with, don't, don't encourage me. <laughs> with that in mind, um, we'll talk about the actual, the, the problem that makes software architecture so incredibly difficult, and I call it the problem with X. We have this ordered, structured thing, this architecture. It's a set of decisions about how, which components should exist and how they should relate to each other. And we put them inside this thing that's constantly shifting, constantly changing, that has no structure, that's disordered. And what's going to happen very quickly is that this X, something is going to pop up in that disordered system that we didn't know about, that we weren't able to predict, that nobody knew was there. And that's a feature of this kind of system. And there's going to be more than one of these Xs. There's lots of them. And you should all recognize this if you've worked for, in software for more than five minutes. And what happens when these Xs pop up is that they put pressure on the software structure and it starts to fall apart. And what happens in that case is that the people who are paying for the software will come along and say, well, this is poor quality, even though it's being crushed by things that nobody knew were there, not even the business themselves. It will still be perceived as poor quality software. The way that we deal with this traditionally in architecture is just to make this bubble smaller, to make our world small and simple so that we don't have to deal with all those X's out there. And we do that through two primary techniques. One of them is called requirements engineering, where we say, if you don't tell me about it, it doesn't exist. The other is risk management, where we make up numbers so that we can say that something doesn't exist. And we use these two things to make our world much, much smaller. And then we can come out of this process certain about our architecture. And then we put it into production, and we only deal with these little Xs we know about that turn up in our requirements and our risks. We put it into production, and X pops up again. It's inevitable, and it will crush our architecture. And this is the problem that we need to solve, the problem with X, these things that stress our architectural decisions that we don't know about, we can't see. And if this was tr in, true for every single project, what I just said, then the only solution to our problem would be to work in an agile way, deal with the problem when it turns up. The problem is that we have a whole bunch of senior architects who keep solving this problem. They're the problem, actually. Everything would be easy if they didn't keep doing their job well. 
People build architectures that solve this problem. And so the question becomes, what are they doing? What are they doing that's different? What is happening here? How can we find that out and teach it to other architects? And it turns out that a lot of these ideas have already been talked about back in the 1980s in this book called The Reflective Practitioner uh, by a guy called Donald Schoen that talks about how we learn to navigate complex contexts, complex environments just by emerging ourselves in them. And over time, we build up a sense of gut feeling around what should be done. And that's the reason why when you ask an architect, how did you arrive at these decisions? They say, I have no idea, but I know it's right. So how do we solve that? Well, the first thing that I've had to do is to define a new theory. Because as I've said, complexity science is, is very interesting, but mostly useless to us as software engineers. And so what I've done is I've reformulated complexity science in a new theory that makes it easy, accessible to us, that allows us to build a bridge between the world of complexity and the world of software in a way that's coherent for us so that we don't get lost in weird terminology and hand-waving. Residuality theory says this. A system exists. It's just a bunch of stuff connected to other stuff. You probably can't see the whole system. And the stuff keeps changing. So what can we scientifically say about this system? Virtually nothing, apart from something is going to happen. X, something will happen. We don't know what it is, we don't know when it's going to happen or why, but it's going to happen. These systems are not static. So we can be fairly certain something's going to happen. When that something happens, the system changes in some way. And we call whatever's left over of the system, the residue, the leftover. And the next thing we can say that's concrete is that something else is going to happen because it's still a complex system. And when that something happens, the future of this system, the future of the system that we're contemplating is going to be a function of the residue. Whatever was left over last time is going to determine what will exist in the future. And you'll have these traces of the past <laughs> constantly reflected in your architecture. Now, as software architects, as we've already said, you can't map this whole thing. You can't predict what this X is, you can't predict what this X is, and you can't predict what those future shapes might be. But we do control the residue. Because when we build a software architecture, when we put our components together, when we decide what modules we're going to have and how they're linked to each other and how they affect each other and how they're connected to each other, we decide a little bit for the software part of the system, how is this thing going to fall apart? We get to determine the residue. We get to say, is the whole thing going to crash or are there going to be little pieces here and there that are still moving, still working whenever this unidentified thing pops up? And so this residuality theory, is, it's very, very philosophical. You can apply this to consciousness and you can apply it to economics and politics and all of those things, but we only care about software, obviously. <laughs> so that's residuality theory. Now we're going to make this a little bit more concrete and we're going to actually apply it to software engineering. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at software from the perspective of, of the complexity sciences. So we're going to go to the other side and look back at software engineering. What is software engineering if we look at it from a complexity science perspective? There's two tools that I want to, that I want to pull out of the complexity sciences that are relevant to us as software engineers. The first one is random simulation. So if I give you a problem to solve, if I say I have a square of side x and inside that square, I have a circle. And I am going to ask you to tell me, what is the area of the circle? And I see everyone's head twitches immediately because you're all looking for R, right? How many of you are brave enough to admit I was looking for R? What's the radius? Then I can do pi R squared. Then I know the answer. It's not possible in this thing. How do, because we can't figure out what R is. We know that it's smaller than X. What we do to solve this problem, and a very common thing that we do in the complexity sciences, is that we randomly simulate this. So we throw a dart at it. 
we throw a dart at the shape, and the first dart, as you can see, hits the circle. And then we throw another dart at it, and the second dart misses the circle. And based on that, I can infer that the circle must be 50% of the shape. Therefore, the area of the circle is x squared over 2. Does that sound ridiculous? It does sound a bit silly, doesn't it? We're going to solve a mathematical problem just by throwing two darts at it. Two darts is a little bit ridiculous. Yeah, we're, we're, we're taking a risk there. But it turns out that if you throw lots and lots of darts at it, you get very, very accurate answers. And not only accurate answers for the circle, but for any shape. You can figure out what the area of the shape is here by randomly throwing darts, randomly picking points of information in this. So it's called random simulation. So think about what you do when you do requirements engineering and you talk to a business person at a particular point in a particular day when they're in a particular mood and you say, how does this work? And they don't even understand where X is or what X is or what's going on in this environment. They don't even want to talk to you. Um, it's a random simulation. Whenever you get a bunch of stakeholders in a room and you say, what's the risk of this happening? And someone says 0.37. That's a random simulation. You might as well use darts. In fact, that's what you're doing. So most of what we do when we're gathering information in these massively complex environments where there is no pi r squared, where there is no rule, most of the time what we're doing is actually randomly simulating an environment. We're telling stories about the environment by randomly looking at different aspects of it. Second thing from the complexity sciences, which is vitally important to our understanding of the systems, is something called a Kaufmann network. This is the bit where you have to pay attention. A Kaufmann network um, was developed by a guy called Stuart Kaufmann in the Stephen Kaufman, in the 1960s. And a Kaufman network is also known as an RBN, a random binary network. And in a Kaufman network, every node, and the nodes are these little circles here, is binary. That means it has two possible values, one or zero. So a good way to think about these networks is that this is a series of light bulbs. It can either be on or off. And they're random because every one of these little light bulbs has a function inside it. And when we press this little button down here to activate the network and they receive a signal, that function will run and it will randomly decide, is this a one or a zero? And so if you press this button, you'll keep seeing different shapes of lights appear in this little network. And the number of possible configurations that this network will have is 2 to the power of n, n being the total number of nodes in the network. And so whenever Kaufman uh, ran these experiments, he had w his n was 100,000. So he had 100,000 nodes. That's 100,000 virtual nodes in the computer, right? He didn't have 100,000 light bulbs. That would be weird. And 2 to the power of 100,000 is an absolutely enormous number. It's more than the known number of atoms in the universe. Uh, so if that's your requirement specification, that's going to take you a very long time to write all that down. Uh, the interesting thing, though, comes when he starts playing with these networks. And the next thing he does is that he connects the nodes to each other. And he makes the function inside one node take the output of another node as a parameter. And so they start to affect each other. And then he goes back to pressing his little button. He probably didn't press a little button. He left these things to run overnight, but I'm telling a story. <laughs> so he realized that this, something weird started to happen. He noticed that the network kept going back to the same configurations over and over and over again as he ran the simulation. And he called these states that the, that the system seemed to want to be in attractors because it seemed like the system was attracted to these particular states. And it turns out that three, there were 317 of these states. And you, and you probably immediately know that that's the square root of 100,000. So the number of states in the system becomes the root of the number of nodes which is a massively smaller number, 317 compared to 2 to the power of 100,000. This is the only reason that we're able to exist in the world. 
Because if you think of the, the complexity of the systems that we have to exist in, just to get yourself from the hotel to this room today, the number of nodes, the number of things that are moving, it's only through the connections to each other, constraining each other, and keeping the number of attractors in, in our systems low is the only way that we're able to survive in the world. And so this concept of attractors is absolutely vital uh, in the complexity sciences. There's a couple of numbers that we can look at, and this is where this will become immediately apparent that, this, that we're talking about software here. A couple of numbers that we can look at in these networks that are important. The first is N, which is the number of nodes in the network. And Kaufman discovered, and some other people followed this up, uh, including uh, Yorya Parisi, who won the Nobel Prize for Complexity Science last year for physics. Uh, if we increase N, we increase the number of attractors. So if you increase the number of nodes in the system, the number of possible states increases, which means you've got more to think about, more to manage. K is a measure of the number of links in the system. And you can either take the average number of links, or as I've done here, take the maximum number of links, which is three. And Kaufman discovered that as we raise K, as you have more links between the nodes in your system, you get more attractors. Not only do you get more attractors, but the path from pressing the button to the system settling down into an attractor becomes more chaotic. So the more links you have, the more madness you're going to have, the more you're going to have to work, the more surprises you're going to get inside your system. And the third value is P, which is the bias in the system. And that works like this. If this node decides to send its message this way 50% uh, of the time, and send its message this way 50% of the time, then we can say that that node has no bias. It's democratic. However, if this node sends its message this way 5% of the time, and this way 95% of the time, then we can say that this node has a high degree of bias. It's biased towards sending a message to that particular node. And what Kaufman discovered was that if you increase the bias of the nodes, then you can increase N and you can increase K, but you can keep the system stable. You can keep the number of attractors small. And that's what you want to do. Now, if you think about this for a couple of minutes, which we, we don't have a couple of minutes now, so I'll do the thinking for you. Um, every an software component analysis that you've ever done in your career has been an NKP analysis. You've been balancing the number of nodes, the number of components, the number of connections between them, and how you bias their communication with each other. How do we bias their communication with each other? Through the standard principles of service orientation, schema, and contract, and policy that we've been doing for 20 years. And so it doesn't matter what methodology you use to get to a component breakdown. If you dig at it, if you dig underneath it, you'll find this NKP analysis is absolutely vital. To, it's what you're doing almost every single time. And so from the perspective of the complexity sciences, software engineering is actually a really simple thing. It's a two-step algorithm. It's a random simulation of our environment, followed by an NKP analysis of potential software structures. So from the perspective of a complexity scientist, software is easy. In which case, we'll say, well, why don't you build it then? So let's come back to residuality theory and put these ideas together. Residuality theory is going to help us to do this job better by making our simulation more random and by making the NKP analysis explicit. So we're just going to turn all the knobs up to 11 using this. So if we go back to our problem with X, what we've said is, what we've learned from Kaufman is that this entire bubble doesn't matter. There's no point in going into every single aspect of this bubble, every single thing that's happening, and learning all the details about all of the things, and capturing all of the requirements, and doing the whole 1.1.1, and all of that there. What we know is that what's important to us in these complex systems is attractors. And the mistake that we make a lot of the times when we're building software is that we build software for one attractor, and then complain when it crashes in every other attractor. So these are the only things that are important. So the question then becomes, which attractors? How do we know where the attractors are? 
And the way to get to those attractors is to press the little button, or in this case, to randomly simulate the environment. So we come up with an X, any X. Um, X can be, for example, what happens when a competitor drops their price? That catches some technical people by surprise because we have to work within X within the business system. It's not just about network failures and bugs. A competitor drops their price. There has to be a reaction in the business environment. We have to drop our price. We have to change our offering. We have to change our processes. We have to fire a bunch of people. We have to maybe buy, buy that competitor. We have to leave that market. But it's going to hit our architecture. And then we're in an attractor. We're in an attractor where a competitor has dropped their price. And we look at our architecture, our software architecture, and we say, did it survive? Did it survive this, this, in this attractor? And we say, no, these two components failed. Whoops. We may, it wasn't the right architecture for that particular thing. But, and when we look at this, and you know if you've done any sort of reviews or if you've been asked to help out, in a, when, a, when a project has crashed, when you look at it, you can immediately see the solution in hindsight. Say, well, if we just put this little green component in here, it wouldn't have crashed. It would have survived in this attractor. This would have been a better architecture. And we park that over here, and we call this residue number one. And then we come up with another stressor, which brings us to another attractor. And we investigate that attractor, and we say, well, this would have needed this little orange component. And we call that residue number two. And we do this, and then we get residue number three. And what we end up with is our original naive architecture, which we came up with two seconds after someone told us what the problem was, and a whole bunch of residues that describe how this thing is going to behave in different attractors. And then what we're going to do is we're going to integrate all of these residues into one single architecture. And when we do this, something weird happens. That's always good when something weird happens. The architecture starts to be able to survive things that it hasn't been designed for, which is exactly what we want. That is the solution to the problem with X. And that might seem like it's magic, but it's not magic. It's very, very simple mathematics. What happens is that every residue we identify will su usually survive in more than one attractor. And every attractor that exists in these systems has a whole bunch of Xs, a whole bunch of things that can push the business system, the entire system, into that attractor. And so what happens is if I identify one stressor, one X that pushes me into this attractor, I will identify this residue. And if I de identify this residue, I'll have a system that will survive all of these Xs. And it doesn't need to know what those Xs are. I don't need to talk about them. I don't need to describe them. And I will put this into production, and one of these Xs will happen, and my business stakeholders will come to me and they'll say, how did you build a system that survived that thing that nobody knew about? And then I'll say, it's because I'm magic. And you need to pay me more. Um, and so every senior architect ever has given exactly that answer. It's because I'm magic and you need to pay me more, and that's fair enough. Um, but it's really simple mathematical leverage. And the most successful senior architects among us have figured this out. You don't have to know what every single one of these Xs are. You don't have to know everything in one of these systems in order to be able to build an architecture that appears to be resilient. There's, there's a really simple mathematical rule in this that, that we can all use. The problem that we have is something that statisticians call the curse of high dimensionality. And the problem is that we're not really very good at being random. So whenever we try to come up with, random uh, with a random simulation, random Xs, we tend to come up with the same tired old stuff. And when you put people in a room together and do this, Nobody wants to be the one who comes up with something that isn't realistic, because nobody wants to look stupid. So nobody wants to admit that I don't know what happens if a competitor drops their price, so I'll not bring that up. And that, that means we miss an attractor. And that means that we get a really weird view of actually what's in the circle, because we're all trying to hit the middle all the time. This is one of the problems with software architecture. We're constantly trying to be correct. In, in, in an algorithmic way, in a world where you simply cannot be correct. And it restricts us. So 
One of the first stressors that I use in every single exercise and every single project is to say to people that a giant fire-breathing lizard is going to come up out of the sea and destroy the city. What's your residue? And this isn't something you do with management. But the point of this is that probability doesn't matter. The probability of what's going to happen is completely irrelevant to what we're trying to do. We're trying to find attractors and we're going to use those attractors to find boundaries in our software so that we can have a solid architecture with a solid set of decisions behind it. Whether or not those lizards exist doesn't matter because predicting lizards might seem, that lizards are going to come out of the sea might seem ridiculous, but predicting your competitor's behavior in a market with so many variables is equally ridiculous. We just do it more often, so it seems reasonable. And so what we're actually trying to do is we're trying to get our architectures to a point which is known as criticality. And criticality looks like this. Um, if we draw a graph of n, which is the number of nodes, and map it against k, which is the number of links between those nodes, you can have a system with very low n and very low k, which we normally would call a monolith. And systems with very low n and very low k, as we all know, are brittle. As soon as X pops up, it's going to fall apart. You're going to have to go in there and rip it to pieces. And you can have systems with very high N and very high K, and we call this microservices. And those are going to have a very large number of attractors. A very large K means that you're going to have very unstable behavior in this system. And it's going to hurt to build and run and look after that system. And somewhere in the middle of all this, we have a line. And Kaufman and others have called this line the edge of chaos, which is a little bit dramatic, but man management consultants love it. The edge of chaos, or this line of criticality. And, and at this point, you have a sufficient amount of N and K for the system to be flexible, to survive in different attractors, but not so much that it's overwhelming to operate and run. And what actually happens in, in real life is that you start off with this monolithic thing and X happens, and it breaks, and you put it back together. But you learned from that breakage, and you put it back together in a slightly different way, and N starts to grow, and K starts to grow. And it gets stressed again, and N and K will grow up until you get to the point of criticality. And once you're on the point of criticality, then you have a system that's going to be able to survive in an unknown environment. Kaufman was a biologist. His work was about how did we get from a bunch of amino acids in an ocean to iPhones? How did that happen? Um, and this is how it happened. By constantly stressing smaller structures, eventually we arrive at some form of criticality. So I'll give you an example, a real world example, of how this works in a project. And we're going to build a system, a cloud-based system that controls charging stations, fast charging stations for electric cars. I know you like those here in Norway. And the naive architecture, like all naive architectures, it got put into production, um, involves signing up for this service, getting a little key fob in the post. And when you drive up to a charger, you hold your key fob up and it takes the ID from the key fob, makes a call to the cloud, checks that you've paid your subscription, and let you charge. And what we then do is we run this thing called a stressor analysis where we identify all of these X's and attractors and we identify our residues. And this is a politically correct version that you produce for management. It doesn't have any lizards or anything in it. And there's a couple of things here that are important that we want to look at. The first is a field login. What happens whenever I drive up to the charger, I hold up my key fob, and the key fob is dead, nothing happens. What's my residue? The residue is this. You have a car, half a ton of metal, parked in front of your asset, which makes you money, and it's not going anywhere because it's got no juice. Can't be charged. You've got an owner of that car, a Tesla owner probably, because back when we were doing this, it was just Tesla, so a rich person. I know you're all rich in Norway. Um, who's going to get angry, and you're going to have a queue building up behind you, behind that customer. The residue is not good. We have to fix that. And so we fix that by adding a little bit of technology. And that technology is called ALPR, Automatic License Plate Recognition. 
So instead of using the key fob, um, we can just scan the number plate, let the person charge, and this decision was made back in the days before electricity cost so much. Let the person charge and let them drive away and we'll catch up with them later. In most jurisdictions, you can get their address, you can send them a, a, a bill. The next thing we look at is stressor number eight, and that is damage to our chargers. Someone's going to drive into those things. And so we want to have some form of redundancy, and we want to have security cameras so that people don't drive into them and then just drive off. We want to know who damaged them. And the next thing that's interesting is stressor number 12. And this is a big problem, which you've probably already experienced here. If the charging station is near a golf course or a shopping mall, people will plug the car in and go away for a very long time. And only the driver can unlock these things. So that's an issue. And we're going to change then what we're going to do is we're going to invoice our customers per minute because we have this ALPR system. We're going to use that. We're going to see if they're still there. And the first 25 minutes cost what they should cost. And the next 25 minutes cost double that. And the next 25 minutes cost even more than that. And so we discourage people from, from this behavior. Some people will still do it because they have lots of money and they don't care. Um, but most people will not park for a long, will not stay plugged in for a longer period of time. All of that is just fairly standard business development. There's nothing special in what I've said so far. The really interesting thing is that when you move through this kind of stressor analysis is that you're going to see this math mathematical leverage start to play out. You're going to see this rule kick in. And stressor number 14 down here is called icing. And icing is one of those X's that you find really difficult to predict. ICE stands for internal combustion engine. And icing is something that started to happen in the United States. What happened was people would look, some, some people would look at an electric car and say, the person who bought that car cares about the environment, which means they probably vote Democrat. And I don't like Democrats. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to park my pickup truck in front of the charger. And then those Democrats won't be able to charge their fancy electric car. That'll show them. Maybe they'll vote differently next time. And this, it sounds ridiculous, but this started to happen, right? And this is the kind of risk that doesn't turn up. No executive looked at their phone during a meeting and said, hey, it's getting, it's getting pretty nasty on Twitter. Do you think people are gonna start parking their pickup trucks in front of our chargers? Nobody can, nobody can see this kind of thing coming. It turns out, though, that the system that we've built by stressing it through a combination of our residues 3, 12, and 8, this problem, which is unpredictable, doesn't matter. Firstly, we have their license plates. We know who you are in your pickup truck. We also have security cameras. So we have a picture of you because this is sabotage. There's going to be a police report. And... Just because your car isn't electric doesn't mean we can't send you invoices. <laughs> and we're going to invoice you per minute. That's going to hurt. And not only that, we have some built-in redundancy in our system. So you're going to have to bring all your hick friends to do this, and you're all going to have to pay an awful lot of money. As a company, we're going to make more money if you do this. This is the kind of behavior that we see in these stressor analysis over and over and over again. By the time you get, and it usually doesn't happen by number 14, you have to go a little bit further. You start to see a system that responds to stressors, to Xs that weren't in the specification. That's how you know you've built a good architecture. And if you thought that this was a specifically American problem, down in Munich, Someone looked at an electric car and thought, that person is probably a vegetarian. <laughs> I'll show them. And so they stuck some mincemeat into the charger. And I guarantee you, no one in their risk register ever <laughs> has a risk. Someone's going to stuff mincemeat in the device. Doesn't turn up. The next step, the next thing we have to do is to pull all of these residues together into coherent architecture. This is the tricky bit. There's a few things we need to, to know before we can have this discussion. So when we have 
a potential architecture. This is, a, this is an architecture that's going to solve the problem. We still, it's still a very structured, ordered thing inside this disordered thing. And so X's or stressors are going to pop up. And one of the schools of thought in software engineering has been just identify all the stressors in the environment and encapsulate them, right? Information hiding and all of those things that object orientation tried to do. It turns out that's very difficult because there's two to the power of 100,000 potential things that could, could happen. Another thing that happens that catches us out is that this, this stressor will act and it will hit component C. But it won't just hit component C. It will also hit component G. Because this happens a lot. This catches us out. In network science, when I have three nodes, like the stressor in C and G here, if I have a relationship between the stressor in C and the stressor in G, that implies a relationship between C and G. That relationship exists. What we're actually saying here is that C and G are coupled. But if you, if you go back a few steps to our architecture, C and G are absolutely not coupled. They're completely separate from each other. In, in our world, in our view of this thing, they are not coupled. But these unknown stressors, they, re they reveal coupling. And we call this hyperliminal coupling because it only happens in it when you put this ordered thing inside a disordered thing and things that we can't see start to happen. And it turns out that every project is riddled with these things. And there's a spider's web of invisible coupling between our components. This is why when something fails, it ripples through the system. This is why engineers have to get up at 3 in the morning and run around shouting at each other, trying to figure out what's happening, what's going on. Every one of these couplings increases K. K increases. Uh, and it makes the system harder to manage. And it turns out, since our, the relationships that we have here, where we said there is no coupling, um, they're based on functional concerns. When these things turn up, these are non-functional couplings. So this is actually, if you can discover these things, this is a way to have a much more sensible conversation about what is a non-functional requirement. Because the way that we do it today is that we go to business stakeholders who have no idea what we're talking about, and we say, what are your non-functional requirements? And everyone ends up in tears, and nobody knows what's, what we're talking about. We end up just using a checklist that some enterprise architect created in the 1990s. And it's a really difficult problem for us to solve. So the way that we solve this is through matrices. And so what we're actually dealing with here are networks, like I said, like, like Kaufman networks, but a little bit more complicated. Um, and those networks become incredibly difficult to draw, um, especially if you can't draw, like me. And so what we do is we represent these networks in matrices, and we use these matrices to describe what's going on in our system. And so here I have an example. This is an incidence matrix that relates my stressors, my random simulation, which is here, to my NKP, to my component choices, which is here. This is just a little snapshot of one particular matrix. And what I do is I, I list all the components in my architecture, and I list my stressors, and I put a 0 if the stressor doesn't hit a particular component, and I put a 1 if the stressor does hit a particular component. And this has a fantastic effect, because what I just talked about, those invisible couplings, every time I see two 1s in the same row, I say, this stressor is coupling these two components. These two components are coupled. What does that coupling mean? It means there's an, if they're not functionally related to each other, if, then there's a non-functional requirement here. And I can capture non-functional requirements without having to talk to people, which is one of our goals as developers, right? And so it's fairly obvious then, these five things are all coupled. What are they coupled by? But if we look at the, at the failure, it's a server failure. We've coupled them all by putting them all on the same server. That's a fairly simple one. But, you know, this is just an introduction. Um, and then what we can see, apart from discovering that kind of uh, non-functional coupling, which is an incredible step forward for us as architects, we can also see which stressors hit our system hardest. And that can lead to a conversation about why are we vulnerable to this particular thing? What extra steps do we need to take um, w whenever this thing hits us? And what does that mean for us? 
and we can also see which components are most vulnerable. And that's a, that's a signal. Which components need to be protected, need to be redundant, need to have some form of recovery mechanism? How important is it to us as a business that that actually works? And if you add up all of these numbers and, and divide them by the number of elements in this matrix, what, you're actually, what we're actually looking at is K in our network. And so what we're trying to do, what we're going to do from this matrix, so we're going to try and refactor. We're going to add components. We're going to take some away. We're going to run these things. And we're going to try and get these numbers down. Because if you get K lower, then you're going to have something that's easier to operate, that has fewer attractors. It's going to hurt you less in production. Another thing that happens is that we can look at components that have exactly the same pattern of response to stress. If they have exactly the same pattern of response to stress, that means that they have the same non-functional requirements. If they have the same non-functional requirements, they can live in the same box. So what we have in this matrix are hints towards what our component structure should be. And that means that whenever someone comes along and says, why, did you, why do you have three components with this many functions in them in your architecture? Instead of just going, well, I don't know, it feels right. You can say, well, I have this matrix and these lizards, and that's why. And it, it, it's more concrete. Another thing, something that's really interesting here, is that we discover coupling that can help us. Um, and if we look at this server failure during, during charge, we see that there's a coupling between the stop charge command and the unlock car command. And you can see that unlock car is written in a different color. And the reason for that is that unlock car was a function that ran on the charger. So it was embedded software. Um, so it was written by a different team. It was very separate. Um, and these things are considered then to be decoupled because we've decoupled the teams. But they're not decoupled, are they? And so what actually happens during a server failure charge? Well, the stop charge command can't make its way from the cloud down to the, the charger, which means that the charger can't actually execute on lock car, which means that if the server goes down while people are plugged in, everyone's stuck. And that happened, and it happened for 24 hours. Not a good situation. This kind of thing can be caught very, very quickly and very early. So from a simple matrix, we can start to have a discussion about non-functional requirements, about coupling, about the number of components, how they're connected to each other, how they should be structured, where they should live. And, so very, and, and this, all of this happens implicitly. It happens in our head at a thousand miles an hour. Sometimes it happens on a whiteboard. Sometimes it happens spread out over weeks. And these decisions become untraceable. We don't understand why or where we've made decisions about our architecture. So when someone comes back in six months and asks us, why does it look like this, we never know. This is the key to putting some traceability into that. And as a final step, and this is what my research project is, is, is going to, to finish on, we can actually prove that we've done real work. Uh, and for architects, that's, that's pretty novel. So we have this thing called the naive architecture, which is what we start out with. And then we produce a bunch of stressors, a bunch of Xs that push us to attractors. And from that, through our matrix, we produce what we call the residual architecture. And they're going to be two very, very different systems. What we do is we have, we have a second set of stressors, which we haven't used. They're, they're unknown unknown unknowns for both of these systems. And we take this set of red stressors and we apply them to the naive architecture. Um, and if the naive architecture survives the stressor, then we give the naive architecture one point. If it doesn't survive the stressor, we give it zero points. And we add all of those ones up and we come up with X. And we do the same thing with the residual architecture. If it survives the stressor, it gets a one. If it doesn't survive the stressor, it gets a zero. And we add all those up, and we call that Y. And for those situations where both of the systems get a zero, where they both don't survive, we look at what state are they in, which one is easier to rescue, which one costs less to rescue, and we give it the point. And then we calculate this thing called the residual index. And the residual index is Y, the number of 
stressors that R survives, minus X, the number of stressors that N survives, divided by S, which is the total number of stressors in our list. And that will give us a value between minus one and one. If that value is greater than zero, then we have empirically produced a system that is more likely to survive unknown sources of stress than the original naive architecture. So we have moved the architecture um, in a direction of criticality. It has shifted towards that green line. Um, and so my research project at the minute is, is based on showing that this happens so consistently that it happens in a statistically significant way. It happens every time we take this approach to architecture. And so what we actually have here, what we've discussed for the last 50 minutes, is a new theory of software engineering. And it's not just a theory, it has a solid theoretical base, and that's been missing in a lot of ideas around software engineering for the last 40 or 50 years. It has a solid theori theoretical and, and philosophical base, but it also gives you concrete tools to solve real problems. And it's properly researched, so it's not just a, another IT book that appears. Um, this has been researched and vetted and peer-reviewed. And it's compatible with all other methodologies. You don't have to throw anything out. You don't have to stop believing in any of the things that you believe in. You can run this alongside whatever method you use today. Um, and, and it shouldn't defend your sensibilities. These ideas have been... I've been doing this for about 10 years. There's a fairly large body of work um, both in academic articles, in computer science journals, um, some architecture journals in the United States, a little bit more corporate, and to the horror of my mathematics professor, in some philosophy journals uh, as well. Um, but most of what we've seen today is based on this paper from last year, Residuality Theory, Random Simulation and Attractor Networks, um, which is the, kind of the core uh, science of the whole thing, which talks about Kaufman. And finally, then, these are my contact details for anyone who wants to reach out or has questions about these things. Um, I work with the Danoshka Data Forening uh, here in, in Oslo, and we run courses on these things. So reach out if you're interested there. And you can follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, um, especially those of you who laughed at the agile jokes will find that uh, entertaining. So. Thank you for coming this morning and uh, see you out there.